come together today to mourn, to remember, to celebrate the life of Brock Lehman. To those of you who are joining us online, I greet you on behalf of the family and thank you for your participation in this unique and trying time. As we gather today, your presence in person and online is a witness to the life and the impact that he made, to the fullness and power with which he lived, the resilience with which he endured, and the legacy that he now leaves. And so as we join together to mourn a death, we also join to remember and celebrate a life. We are united, both in body and in spirit, in memory and grief, and so may we also be united in unity and hope. Today we are in the midst of pain of human loss, but we remember the words of Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so we ask God to grant us grace. In pain, may we find comfort. In sorrow, may we find hope. And in death, resurrection. We have three purposes today. First is to remember our loved one. To remember Brock as he was. Second is to mourn and draw strength together. To remember that we are not alone in our grief and that we are not the only people who mourn, that you are not isolated. But third is to remember a hope big enough even for the pain we now feel. And so as we begin, let us pray. Almighty God, all good things come from you. And eventually all people do return to you. And so, God, we thank you for the life of Brock Lehman. We ask that you would hold him close until we see him again. That, God, you would strengthen each of our hearts for the days ahead. That you would help us to live as those who ourselves are prepared to die, and that when our days are accomplished, that you would enable us to die as those who go forth to really live. In living and dying, may our life be found in you, and may nothing in life or death Separate us from your great love. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. One of the biggest legacies, and one of the most cherished things that Brock leaves behind is sitting in this room. And so I'd like to invite the grandchildren forward for a song. Grandkids, if you'll come forward. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. So let's talk about that love. Great job, grandkids. I'm going to read from part of that Bible that talks about that love, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to pull some selections here. And it reads like this, and it reads for a time like now. We know that if the tent we live on in earth is torn down, we have a building from God, a house that isn't handmade, eternal, and located in heaven. And while we grow and live in this residence... We want to dress ourselves in that building from heaven. So we are confident because we know that while we are living in the body, we might be away from the Lord, but we live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Let's talk about walking by faith in that body away. Brock W. Lehman, 68 of Fremont, passed away peacefully in his home from ALS on uh, August 13th of this year. Born in Bozeman, Montana on December 15th, 1951 to William and June. He grew up in Iowa, graduated from Jefferson Community High School in 1970, and in 1974 received a degree in business from Wayne State College. Married to Joanne, June 30th, 1973 in Iowa. 
He was employed by Valmont Industries his entire career, formed numerous lifelong friendships, traded unique nicknames, started in the irrigation division, ended up as a regional sales manager of Tubular Products, member of First United Methodist Church where he endured his son's performances in church activities and various choirs. He enjoyed spending as much time as possible outside feeding the birds and squirrels while smoking a cigar on the back deck. He was an avid golfer, a member of the Fremont Golf Club, loved shooting sports, member of the Elkhorn Valley Rifle Club, shot uh, at the Valley Trap League on Tuesday, a uh, member of the Trap and Skeet Range, and in order to protect those uh, rights and pursuits, committed member of the NRA, loved sports both as an athlete and a spectator, cherished the opportunity to follow his uh, and support his son's athletic careers, and later, watching and following his grandchildren's hunting, fishing, and sporting activities. Like many of us, he may have been a little bit too attached to the success of the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Let's start with talking about that. Bryce, if you'll make your way forward and tell us some stories. I've given hun hundreds of pep rally speeches, end of season banquet speeches, and post match pep talks. Never have I struggled at finding the right words to adequately express the amount of love and respect I have felt for someone. Dad was Superman to me, with more profanity. Dad strived to raise three capable young men. He drilled into us the importance of doing it right or doing it again. Around our house, it became a survival strategy to recognize his projects were coming coming up, and making sure Brocky was the first son he found, if possible. As we got older, he gifted us boys tools every Christmas, and he made sure we knew how to use them every... Excuse me, I'm sorry. Made sure we knew how to use every one of them. Again, not always willingly. Growing up, it seemed that there wasn't anything Dad couldn't fix. As an adult, I learned to be cautious mentioning problems around my own house to him. I once told him I had an ice maker not working, and less than a week later, he showed up at my house with parts, and I got a surprise lesson. Another passion of Dad's was watching us boys take part in athletics. He rarely missed any of mine or my brother's games, races, or matches. We knew this because he could blast a whistle that would echo throughout the loudest gyms. We knew better than to test his patience with homework questions, but you could always count on Dad to help with sports. Again, his lessons came with a twist because he was extremely competitive, too, and letting us win wasn't an option. He taught us the importance of commitment to the team and being accountable for what we brought to the table. Nothing is given and everything is earned. Wrestling. My father grew up wrestling and I followed in his footsteps. It was a love we shared together. I'll never forget the proud look on his face when I won my first match, or how excited he got when I asked him to be my coach at the Cornhusker State Games. I remember after my freshman season, college wrestling came to a close, I mistakenly called Dad complaining. I wasn't happy with the season. I wasn't sure if I liked the school. I was angry. In Dad fashion, he delivered tough love, and the conversation ended pretty quickly after his response. A couple of days later, this letter arrived at my dorm. And it's dated February 6, 2004. Dear Bryce, you know, it's becoming harder to write because at this point, I never had anyone writing me, and I felt it was always me against anyone, and I had no one who understood what I was going through. But I believed in what I could do. I know what you feel, Bryce, because I've been there. I had to pay my dues, just like, just like you're doing now. The road is tough, but stay the course. You can either play it, play on the edge, and never move to the next level, and no one can tell you what your next move is. You are the captain of your destiny. You have the talent. Sure, you had to learn new things, but life is like that. And always will be. Adjusting to change and learning new things. Like I've told you, and your brothers. In the 
these notes. Confidence, belief in yourself, and living life are the, are the keys. Do what you want to do, Bryce. Believe in yourself and in whatever you understand and never make excuses. You set and determine your goals. Remember what I've told you guys, and it may begin to make, make more now. There's no free lunches. Kick those, kick those asses and don't be afraid to, to be the mean son of a... <laughs> has to be. And don't get too big to show respect. Love, Dad. The big guy always... <clears throat> he always wanted the best for us, even when, we str when he struggled to show it. He was our loudest fan and our toughest critic. I'm incredibly thankful that not only did he see his sons grow into capable, confident, and su su successful men, but he watched us boys become fathers and carry on the traditions he taught us. Go first because now I'm too emotional. Um, I'll do the best I can. If I don't look up, I'm sorry because Dad was always about public speaking, but if I look up, I, I might not finish, so sorry. Um, family and friends, and various Cyclone fans in the audience, um, on behalf of Mom and Brennan and Bryce and our families and myself, which is like intense of you here, so mostly you guys. Um, I want to express our deepest gratitude for your support today, um, not just today, but also during Dad's sickness, and then all the other times we had to deal with Dad's grumpy side, even when he wasn't sick. Um, you guys are here because of your family, and whether it's blood or family bond, I appreciate you guys coming. It's, it's a big commitment to be here. Um, although we've had well over a year to prepare for this day, and knowing full well that this is the only end for a disease like this, it doesn't make the day any easier. Dad never wanted us to think about his life as what the disease had made him. He didn't want you to remember him as young, athletic, and vibrant. Or if you're one of us children, remember his footsteps like those of the steps of God. As we learned, depending on where you were at in the house, if you heard his business steps coming in from the garage up or down the steps, sometimes he had only moments to hide before he hollered your name. Or specifically, my name. <laughs> You'd hear him coming and it would be... And you knew it was going to be a rough day. Um, if he was in a good mood, it was only going to take a jiff. In Dad's terms, that meant the rest of your day is shot. <laughs> Tomorrow's probably not looking so great either. Because <laughs> as Bryce alluded to, by God, if you're going to do a job, you're going to do it right. So that means we're going to measure it and do it 37 times before it finally looks good. <laughs> if he was in a bad mood, it was a lot like the scene on Jurassic Park where the Tyrannosaurus Rex walks by the car and everyone just goes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, as the oldest, I couldn't just hide like Bryce. <laughs> but if you were in trouble, he would find you. Brennan once remarked that some people find it really funny that as somebody as big and as tall and as strong as he is, automatically flinches when somebody walks by in close proximity. <laughs> the reason for this is simple. Dad was really, really good at flicking the top of our head when we walked by. To the very end, Dad claimed that he got us with his knuckle. Well, to this day, Brennan claims that he got us with one of his rings. <laughs> Either way, Brennan usually gave Dad a lot of practice at developing his unique skill set. But unfortunately, Bryce and I didn't develop the razor-sharp reflexes to avoid it. In Dad's defense, it isn't always easy raising three high-energy boys. We were always into something or doing something, and he was adamant that we represent the family name. For Dad, honor, integrity, courage, and devotion those weren't just words. 
I remember one time my friends and I broke a few boards on a privacy fence my sophomore year of high school. But don't worry, Bruce, the cops got us. <laughs> we got interviewed, and the officer ended the meeting by saying, you boys better call your parents, because we're calling them too. And I was at my friend's house. We all got together to make sure that we all knew what we were going to say to the police. And so I tried calling home right away, and the line was busy. So I was like, okay, I'll give it a couple of minutes, then I'll try it again. And then the police beat me to the punch. And to make it worse, it was one of the only times in Dad's entire life that he answered the phone. <laughs> Dad called my friend's house, and I picked up the phone, and my friend's mom was like, Brock, it's for you, it's your dad. And there is no worse words spoken on this earth. And all I heard was, get home now! <laughs> pedal my bike home. It was the longest mile bike ride of my life, and he was at the end of the driveway waiting for me. Fortunately, the neighbors were outside, <laughs> which left too many witnesses. And as I got in the house, my great aunt Marge was sitting on the couch, and that was another witness. And I think he was so mad that indecision got the best of him. He didn't really know what to do. And so, ultimately, I got grounded. It was the only time in my life I've ever been grounded, but I lived to be here to tell the story. We uh, had to fix the fence, but because I went to the Brock W. Lehman School of Fence Building a year before, where we <laughs> put up the fence, I learned how to do it, and I knew how to do it, so we got the fence fixed, and we ripped off a couple more rotten boards and replaced those, and I think Dad was ultimately proud because his big fear in life was that I was just going to be an idiot and couldn't do anything. And so I think he was pretty proud of that. And he was proud that I took ownership of my, state, or my mistakes and I never tried to pass it off to somebody else. And so maybe he thought I'd learned my lesson. And that I had taken something pretty bad and turned it into a positive and kind of grew as a man. But mostly I think it was because Brennan was coming along and made them appreciate me more. <laughs> No matter what, though, Dad was always there for our sporting events, like Bryce said. It didn't matter if it was a little league game or if it was whatever. He was there, whether you wanted him to be or not. Um, he made time to be there. As long as he wasn't on the road, he was at those games. Even when I played in JV basketball my junior year, my position was officially known as bench. He saw every glorious 30-second stretch that I got into the game. If we were going to suffer... That was the one thing about Dad, he was going to be right there with us, though not always in silence. I remember one junior high tournament game where Dad, he was riding me, and he was getting into the game a little too much, and finally I turned around and said, from, this, from the court, that's back when I actually played, I said, Dad, would you just shut up? <laughs> and the minute the words left my lips, I was, dude, it was bad. <laughs> you just knew it, because worse was then Dad was silent. And for those of you who knew Dad pretty well, when he got real quiet, it was going to get real bad. And when I got home, he was waiting in the kitchen for me. And he got right up into my face, and he said, I won't say another word, but if you ever tell me to shut up again, I will drop you. <laughs> True to his word, though, he never did say anything again. He kept his mouth shut, which was pretty impressive. I I can't even do that. Though in his own way, he communicated his thoughts. By the time I got into high school, he was going to time my races, and then he wrote down all my lap splits. And then on the laps that I kind of fell off the pace or they were kind of bad, he would casually circle them and then leave them on the kitchen table. So that way I would find them. But he loved to be involved, and he loved to feel involved. He loved being a track and cross-country dad. He loved being a basketball dad. He loved being a wrestling dad. And he took special pride in being a coach's dad. If anything, it gave him another chance to get another hat. He always read my cross-country write-ups at the end of every meet. And if there was a particularly rough meet, he would always reply, Be patient, coach. You'll get him there. Dad was pretty guarded about his past. I hear the odd story from time to time about his mischievous past, but Dad always tried to keep them from us. One time we were in Jefferson for a golf tournament, we ran into one of his old classmates at a gas station. 
I don't know why I'm always with the crying kid. <laughs> Just never get away. And those two got to talking about some old times in high school or something. And the guy, and I don't know who it was, but he, he looked at Dad and he's like, Hey, Brock, you remember that time Dad was like, <clears throat> <laughs> and the guy looked at me and he looked at dad and he said oh <laughs> so I never got to hear some of those stories the one part of his past though that he loved to share with his boys were stories about his grandpa or his grandpas he revered both men they were his heroes and everything he aspired to be in this world the cowboy, the fisherman, the hunter Tough and honest and brave. Those were the traits he wanted us to have. As I look at the relationship Dad had with his grandpas, it reminds me of the loss I have without the time with my own grandpas. One thing I learned in my life is that Grandpa is a boy's first and greatest hero. I know Grandpa Lehman was to me, and Dad was to my son. It'll be hard knowing Dad isn't around to listen to the stories and the bragging. A boy gets to do, but I know that somehow Dad will know about it. Sorry. Growing up with Dad wasn't always easy, especially when your name was Brock. In the eyes of his sons, he loomed larger than life. Dad could be hard to know, but I know he loved us and tried in his own ways to show us how much he was proud of us and how much he loved us. He raised us to be men and he raised us to be leaders. I know he wouldn't want you to cry over his death, which is what I'm doing now. <laughs> Be like, don't cry for me. <laughs> because of the sacrifices of mom, dad was able to die in his own home peacefully, with his cat sleeping beside him. And I'm sure if he could, Dad would want the cat to say a few words too. <laughs> his peaceful death and Mom's last act of defiance, that was their victory over ALS. ALS took his body and his life, but could never take the lessons he taught us and the pride he had for his three sons. In the book, The Old Man and the Boy, at the end, the old man learns he's dying. And he tells his grandson, you'll be a man with all a man's problems. And there ain't no old man to steer you. I raised you as best I could. And now you're the old man, because I'm tired, and I think I'll leave. It's the same for Dad. He raised us to be men and deal with a man's problems. Everything from basic home repair, whether we wanted to learn it or not, to the death of our own father. The grandpa story ends by telling the grandson that no matter what, he won't die on the opening day of bird season. Dad borrowed the book, and it was years ago, but he wrote me a note. Of course, he wrote it in the book and wrecked it. <laughs> but he wrote me a note and promised me the same thing. He said he wouldn't die on opening day of bird season. And like the old man, Dad kept his promise. shared about your dad and the stories that the four of us when we got or the five of us though when the four of you shared with me when we got together to talk I loved hearing about how he was larger than life uh, how uh, how he had this outgoing personality he could to talk to a, a brick wall if he needed to because he's a salesman but also I loved hearing the way that he would care for his caregivers that the people who were responsible for his own well-being that, that he'd always ask about their families and how they loved him dearly. How he could be incredibly social in public, but also incredibly private in his personal life. That's why he never really 
never really shared too much about what he was going through with ALS. I loved hearing and even more seeing the impact that he left on each of you as a father. Seeing and hearing the impact that he left on you as a husband. I loved hearing the stories uh, that you shared about each other and the fierce love that he built into his family. I loved, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was Bryce that told this story about Brennan. He said one day, you know, Brennan got into a fight as a kid and it didn't end well. Um, and then dad got more mad at Brock than he did at, at Brennan uh, because he didn't protect him. And he believed the family stuck together and um, Brock's response was, I held his hat dad. <laughs> I love the way he would go above and beyond. Uh, hearing the way he would go above and beyond for his family. And, uh, and you know how he traveling, they'd go straight through, you know, they wouldn't stop, and straight through two days to Montana, and uh, on the way home, uh, I think, Brock, you were trying to get, convince him to stop in fair country, right? You really wanted to see fair country, and um, didn't happen, and so they get home, and they're asking, you know, they get almost home, what was your favorite part of the trip, and, and it's Brock, and, well, if we had stopped in fair country, that would have been my favorite part, so, uh, <laughs> you know, Dad and, and Joanne look at each other and go, well, you know, all right, fine, I mean, we're not too far gone, they turn around and they drive back after, you know, two days on the road. I loved hearing about how he was kind of a guy's guy, right? I mean, it was the sports, it was the coaching, it was teaching you to repair things. It was building not just a home, but building a family. And building children who would take care of their own families and love their own families. He wanted you to be self-reliant. And that wasn't just for his boys. I love the story, uh, hearing about one time, you know, after uh, ALS had, had begun to take a toll on his body, how he heard a uh, uh, toilet running upstairs um, and he couldn't fix it himself. And, and so he calls Joanne and says, hey, uh, there's, a, there's a toilet running upstairs. And um, she goes, well, great, I'll call a plumber. And he goes, no, 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 no. Um, go to Menards to get this part. By the way, here's a YouTube video. You're going to go fix this. Uh, <laughs> I loved hearing how he had the discipline and the tough love for his kids that raised them into the fine young men they are. He was competitive with you, and so if you played basketball, I, I heard he might have occasionally checked you into the boards. Um, he wasn't going to let you win, but that meant that if you did, you'd won fair and square, and you could hold your head high. I also heard that changed a little bit when the grandkids came around. Um, Bryce, I think you were the one who said that you watched him, uh, you watched one of one of your kids take food off of Grandpa's plate, and, and your first thought was, well. There goes one, like there's just no chance, right? <laughs> and he just laughed it off. So I want to talk just to the grandkids who sang so beautifully earlier. You need to know this. He loved you so much. And he loved watching you play sports, and he, he loved watching you hunt and fish, and he loved hearing your stories. And by God, if you called the house and talked to Grandma and not him, you weren't in trouble, but your parents and Grandma were. <laughs> Because no matter what happened, he loved you and wanted to hear about how you were doing. And he was so proud of you. It was a beautiful life, and it leaves behind beautiful lives. And even if his own was cut short by a horrible disease, it was a life that was full of that which he loved best. You. So how do we wrestle with death in a time like this? I mean, on one hand, we wrestle it and we say there is a release uh, from the ravages of a terrible disease. And on the other, we also rightfully mourn and say, of course, we want to see him again and we miss him. And we hold these two emotions in tandem. I love the words that the Apostle Paul wrote in, in 2 Corinthians 5. We know that if the tent we live on on this earth is torn down, talking about our bodies as a tent, not as a permanent home, that we still have a building from God. A house that isn't handmade, eternal or located in heaven. The hope that this life we live in isn't the last life. And that this body we have isn't an eternal body. And that those struggles that he went through will not be the last word. And the scripture goes on, we are confident because we know that while we live in this body, we are away from our home in the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. Live, walk, move, act, exist. I 
I take comfort in the fact that suffering bodies are not eternal bodies. And that the God who sees us suffer is the God who brings us comfort. So we believe that Brock is now at peace. And the fight which he fought so well is now ended. That final act of defiance is validated. And the hope and consolation of eternity begins. And so in this time of saying goodbye and mourning, I offer you words that have brought comfort to generations. The words of the 23rd Psalm, dating back even before Christianity itself, words of comfort in a time like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures, leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. What my eyes will see when your face is before me, I can only imagine. sinned, we ask you to grant mercy, and to those who are sorrow, God, we beg for your peace. We ask that you would keep true in us that love with which we hold one another. That, God, you would hold Brock close until each of us see him again. 
God, you would let him know that we are okay. Because we have each other and the lessons and memories that he leaves behind. That God, we would draw strength from your word. That we would be able to share in the joy of his memory. That we might tell stories and laugh. That we might remember and love. And that God, forever our lives might carry the mark that Brock put there. God, we ask that you would hear these words as we join with one voice in the prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Following this service, there will be a lunch, a chance to share stories and, and connect with uh, family members and friends, uh, to laugh and mourn, to celebrate and cry. That lunch is going to happen at 1937 Park Place, right after, right after this. It's a chance to come together and show the family love. And so I'm going to pray, if we could, to bless that food before we part. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for uh, the meal that we are about to receive. We thank you for the hands that prepared it. And God, we ask that through it, and through that time of sharing, that God, we might experience a bit of your healing, your presence, and your peace. God, just as you are with Brock, and he is with you, may you be with us, and may we be with you. It's in your son's name we pray. Now hear these words of benediction. May God hold Brock close until each of us see him again. May we hold each other close as we mourn and seek to do life without him. May we cherish his memory in our hearts. Comfort his loved ones with our faith. And honor his legacy with our very lives. We ask this in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.